Welcome to the public, and we are ready as an education committee to go ahead with exacting today. First, I'd like to recognize those folks that are sitting in the committee. Representative Nodder, why don't you introduce yourself? Hello, I'm Janine Nodder. Um, I represent the town of Merrimack. Hi. And Representative Hall. <laughs> Hi, my name is Jennifer Morton. I represent the town of Amherst. Thank you. And I think we're good um, all the way around elsewhere. Yep. Okay, welcome. So what we have today is we have some bills uh, on the docket here. I'd like to explain there are several bills which 382, we have a record that that bill was done. 382 came out with a 20 to 0 recommendation ITL and Representative Cordelli is going to write the the committee report seeing that he's the one that made the motion 517 came out with a ought to pass 19 to 0 vote and representative mel myler was the one who made that motion so he will also write that report we there was some question regarding the 553 bill relative to school district information on personnel salaries, there is no record of that bill being taken. So it's on our docket correctly here. There's absolutely nothing in the file. Whereas the other ones do show the roll call votes in the, in the file. So we're good with those other two. So with that, I'd like to start right at the top today with HB 71, repealing a Department of Education report on charter public school funding. Is there a motion? Representative Ford. Ought to pass. Is there a second? Second. Representative Myler makes the second. So we have ought to pass on repealing a Department of Education report on charter public school funding made by Representative Ford, second by Representative Myler. Representative Ford, do you care to speak to your vote? Uh, I think we pretty well. A motion? This. Uh, an extreme, so I think we're going to. Your mic. Chair? Yes. Do we, um, we're on 71. Yeah. And uh, according to my notes uh, on, I'm not sure the date we did this, February 1st or February 16th, we, we did consider an ought to pass that um, came out that failed. Do we have to reconsider that ought to pass? Let me look at it too. What was the date on that? February what? Um, I'm, uh, February 16th. It's either February 1st or February 16th. I don't know why I've got both. I think we, re we recessed it to the 16th. Oh, to the 16th. Okay. I see, I see that on the 16th, um, HB 71 OTP dry, but that's all been scratched out on this. Yeah. Right. I'm showing you dry Cordelli, about to pass, mm -hmm. 10 10. And then I have that we reset. And then we reset. Right. Okay, I don't have that on this but sheet. I, I, would, I would move to, well, not on the prevailing side. There's no prevailing side. <laughs> 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 I, I don't think you need that in the committee. What's that? I don't think we need it in the committee. Right. Right. But do you want to reconsider the OTP and then? Uh, that motion was made by whom? Brian Cordelli was the original motion. Well, Representative Dry is not here. Not here. <laughs> <laughs> but Representative Cordelli is here. And that's the best we can do. Should we uh, reconsider then? Uh, yeah, I, I, let's let's go with the motion to reconsider and you make that, seeing you made the second on that. And, that, and the person making the motion is not here. So I will move uh, uh, reconsideration on House Bill 71. I'd second that. Okay, so the, at, uh, Madam Clerk, at the top there, we're on reconsideration, just on the reconsideration vote right. only. It's not an option, so I don't yeah. know. Okay. Made by Representative Cordelli and second by Representative Luno. Is there any any discussion here on the reconsideration? Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? 
<clears throat> Vice Chairman Cordelli? Yes. Representative Leckis? Yes. Representative Ford? Yes. Representative Belcher? Yes. Representative Nodder? Yes. Representative McDonald? Yes. Representative Noble? Yes. Representative Petternell? Yes. Representative Cordello? Yes. Representative Myler? Yes. Representative Cornell? Yes. Representative Tanner? Yes. Representative Luno? Yes. Representative Ellison? Yes. Representative Woodcock? Yes. Representative Morton? Yes. Representative Balboni? Yes. Representative Cascadden? Yes. Representative Damon? Yes. Chairman Ladd? Yes. 20 yeas, zero nays. Thank you. Representative Ford, you're recognized for a motion. Move up to pass. Second. Representative Myler makes a second on that. Discussion from the maker of the motion. I think we discussed this pretty well already, but I have nothing really further to add to it. Okay, Representative Myler. Move ahead. Okay, any further discussion from members of the committee? Not see any. Uh, Madam Clerk. Vice Chairman Cordelli. Yes. Representative Leckis. Yes. Representative Ford. Yes. Representative Belcher. Yes. Representative Notter. Yes. Representative McDonald. Yes. Representative Noble. Yes. Representative Petternell. Yes. Representative Cortiello. Yes. Representative Myler. Yes. Representative Cornell. Yes. Representative Tanner. No. Representative Luno. Yes. Representative Ellison. Yes. Representative Woodcock. Yes. Representative Morton. Yes. Representative Balboni. No. Representative Cascadden. No. Representative Damon. No. Chairman Ladd. Yes. 16 yeas, four nays. Will there be a minority report? No. 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 Okay, Representative Ford, you will make that report. Next bill down on the docket here is 168. This is relative to surety indemnification for career schools. <clears throat> Representative Cordell, you're recognized for a motion. I would like to move out to pass. Is there a second? Representative Leckis seconds that motion. Motion made by Representative Cordelli, second by Leckis. Representative Cordelli. Uh, thank you. I, I believe we had two uh, bills related to uh, this topic. Uh, the other bill um, we retained, I think it was 155. Um, right, we retained that one. And uh, wanted to move ahead with this one. Um, the uh, House Bill 155 we retained so that if anything happened to this one along the way, we had uh, 155 in our back pocket. Um, this basically was uh, um, relative to the surety bonds required for uh, career uh, schools. Um, this was uh, the recommendation of the department um, and uh, the hope that um, it would allow uh, additional uh, schools to uh, have the necessary uh, funds to uh, get the surety bond and um, uh, increase possibly in the future the number of career schools um, that will be uh, approved. Uh, so that's the reason for the ought to pass motion. Further discussion? Representative Myler. Yes, I, <clears throat> as we looked at this, uh, obviously the concern that we have is to make sure the um, students don't get uh, hung with a bill if in fact the uh, career school should uh, go under. Mm -hmm. And what we really would like to do is we would like to have somebody come in. We're not sure whether this was, is a 10% on this particular right. bill. Yes. We're not sure whether 10% is, is an appropriate withhold uh, or uh, insurance that they should have. And I think during our conversation, we talked about the need to have somebody like Primex come in and, and kind of inform the committee of exactly what is 
should be 10%, maybe it should be 20%, or maybe 15%. We don't know whether 10% is the appropriate amount. And so um, I'm going to be voting against uh, the OTP in the hopes that we can move this to a retain and put it within the same category as we did 155. And uh, during that retention process, have somebody from the insurance industry come in and at least uh, give us uh, an indication of what would be the appropriate thing. 10% might be okay, but we don't know that. Uh, and so that's, there's an unsurety here of, of exactly what it should be. Not we're not necessarily opposed to the concept, but we just don't know what, it, what the percent should be. And so, Mr. Chair, uh, that's what I'm going to do. And hopefully if we have a 10-10 vote, I will then move to, to retain the bill uh, and get some more information so that we can act appropriately. Thank you. Representative Cordelli. <clears throat> uh, yes, I, I think that we had uh, testimony from uh, Mr. Appleby that there's uh, been approximately uh, only four closures of career schools in 20-plus uh, years. So I think um, we're on uh, pretty safe ground with this. Any further discussion on this bill? Not seeing any, Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Vice Chairman Cordelli? Yes. Representative Luckus? Yes. Representative Ford? Yes. Representative Belcher? Yes. Representative Notter? Yes. Representative McDonald? Yes. Representative Noble? Yes. Representative Petternell? Yes. Representative Cortiello? Yes. Representative Myler? No. Representative Cornell? No. Representative Tanner? No. Representative Luna? No. Representative Ellison? No. Representative Woodcock? No. Representative Morton? No. Representative Balboni? No. Representative Cascadon? No. Representative Damon? No. Chairman Ladd? Yes. Ten yeas, ten nays. Mr. Chair? Yes. I move to retain uh, House Bill 168. Is there a second? I'll second. Representative Tanner seconds the motion to retain. Retaining motion made by Representative Myler. Representative Myler, we would like to speak to your motion. I think I have. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Tanner. Further discussion on retaining this bill. Sure. Representative Luno. So <clears throat> thank you very much, and uh, Mr. Chair. As, as Representative Cordelli um, uh, remarked uh, just a few moments ago, uh, over the last couple of decades, there have been four closures of, of career schools in New Hampshire. Um, uh, we also heard testimony, well, we also heard Representative Cordelli say that there's a, a strong interest to, um, to, to have more career schools come into New Hampshire. So, you know, based on, on the, that, that playing field, we, we could very well see more than, than, um, than four closures. What happened to the, um, to students' um, uh, prepaid tuition uh, dollars in those foreclosures. We don't know what happened there. We don't know what's going to happen uh, uh, down the road with an increased number of, um, of, of career schools uh, opening up. I think we all uh, recognize the importance of career schools uh, uh, coming into the state, but we want to make sure they do it on a basis that, uh, that obviously serves students as well as our, our economy. And uh, and I really don't see any um, any drawback to uh, to retaining this uh, so that uh, so that we can um, vote on it in uh, in January and, um, and knowing that uh, that either 10 percent is the right amount or whether it should be 8 percent or whether it should be 15 percent uh, to just have a little bit more, um, um, you know, technical support from uh, uh, from Primex on this, I think would be very helpful. Further discussion from the committee. I'd like to just say that the bill was presented by uh, Director Appleby from the Department of Education. I'm sure that when they presented something such as this, that they had addressed the issue of 10 percent. This bill has 10 percent in and so does 155. And we retain the 155 to address that very issue. But uh, recognizing that uh, Director Appleby did send this forward to us for passage, I have to assume that they have a pretty good handle on this and have done that inquiry into the 10%. So with that, I will not vote to retain this bill. Further discussion? 
Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Vice Chairman Cordelli. No. Representative Leckes. No. Representative Ford. No. Representative Belcher. No. Representative Nodder. No. Representative McDonald. No. Representative Noble. No. Representative Petternell. No. Representative Coratiello. No. Representative Myler. Yes. Representative Cornell. Yes. Representative Tanner. Yes. Representative Luna. Yes. Representative Ellison. Yes. Representative Woodcock. Yes. Representative Morton. Yes. Representative Balboni. Yes. Representative Cascadin. Yes. Representative Damon. Yes. Chairman Lack. No. Ten yeas, ten nays. Um, are there any further motions? Oh, I'll move uh, ITL. Are there, is there a second to ITL? Second. <clears throat> <laughs> have Representative Damon. Uh, made by uh, Representative Luno, second by Representative Damon. Motion is ITL. Any further discussion from the committee? Sure. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, you know, I, I don't, I, I mean, I, I, you know, I think the recommend, a recommendation of ITL uh, would not have been my my first choice. I think retaining would have been by far my first choice. Uh, I don't have any reason to believe 10% is, is not a good number, but I don't have any reason to believe that it is because we did not have the testimony um, uh, that other than but from um, from Mr. Mr. Appleby uh, with respect to um, to this to this bill. And um, I think coming from uh, you know, at least four four years that I spent on the um, on the Commerce and Consumer Affairs Committee, uh, and spending a lot of time with the um, Department of Justice um, uh, Consumer Protection Division chief, that uh, that you know this is an area that New Hampshire has to take very seriously. Um, uh, I, I would, you know, if the, I I know we've got a busy two weeks ahead this week, and then the first part of next week, where we I think we have to have all our bills out, right? By the sixteenth. By the sixteenth. Yeah. Um, I don't know if we could, if we could push this one, to recess the exec, and and maybe get even getting some written testimony from Primex could be helpful, um, and and then we could uh, we could reconsider the ought to pass motion and and move forward with it. But I, I just feel real squishy about it, right now. Further discussion. Is a motion to recess this in order? Pardon me? Is a motion to recess this bill in order? Well, if you're if you, it, on the floor, so there, there's an ITL on the floor. We've come down to this point before. Um, but we could ask. And what you could do is you could ask for a reconsideration on your last vote, and then we could recess it. And so the vote, your vote would have been a retain or, um, in the case the other side, to OTP. But that during the time, if we bring it up, then again, like we could do it tomorrow, or in in a Primex, if uh, Re, uh, Director Appleby could be contacted, uh, could we find out uh, what's the difference between ten percent, twenty percent, fifty percent? I don't know myself, uh, but it basically it depends upon the tuition for that particular uh, uh, organization. Right, right. So, so, Mr. Chair, if we could, if we could get some, some at least better visibility to to how the ten percent was arrived at and what other things were considered, and and yes, uh, you know, if Primex is in support of that, uh, then uh, then you know, this committee may be in a position to ought to pass this, um, you know, with a strong bipartisan vote. But but if you're suggesting that maybe we could um, reach out, we could email um, Mr. Appleby. Uh, to get some, so even a paragraph of written testimony, I'd be happy to withdraw my motion. Okay, we can have that information back from Director Appleby by, you know, Wednesday. I, sh I let's would do, let's that would so be great. So if you want to read, I'll withdraw the ITL motion. And who made the second on that? Represent Damon. That's fine. Yeah, okay, great. So with that, we're going to recess this hearing until a time to be uh, announced, based upon our uh, report back from uh, Director Appleby. I'll reach out to him. Thank you very much, Mr. Okay, Chair. You're welcome. I appreciate it. And Representative Damon. Just clarification, will we hear from Primex as well as Mr. Appleby? That would be part of the request. Thank you. Yeah. 
And Representative Cordelli will contact Director Appleby on that. And Appleby can then contact Primex. Yeah, yep. Yeah. All right, um, going on down to the next bill, 377. This is a bill relative to screening and intervention in public schools for dyslexia and related disorders. Uh, Representative Cordell, you're recognized for a motion. I move out to pass. Is there a second on the ought to pass? Representative Tanner seconds the ought to pass. Um, yeah, oh, let's let the the uh, person that made the motion to talk first. Uh, Representative Cordelli, do you have any discussion on 377? Um, uh, I, I think it is um, probably a step forward in terms of uh, testing our children for dyslexia. Um, I'm uh, interested in uh, seeing what the amendment might show as we have um, one amendment um, on the table already. Um, that's it. Well, we have the bill on the table. We don't have any amendment on the table at this that, point. Yeah, uh, right. on the table. And uh, Representative Tanner, are you talking about zero three set five seven? Zero five one six H. Okay, that's a new one. Okay, Representative Tanner, you're recognized. So um, this new new amendment, what it does is it takes out the uh, financial part of this bill, which was um, kind of problematic. Can you hold on just a second until sure. everybody gets it in front of them? Thank you. Now, for everybody, make sure you have the right amendment. I have on record several other amendments which yeah. we've had on this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've had 0234 and 0357, and now we're dealing with 0516. Representative Tanner. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I've been in contact with the sponsor of the bill, uh, Representative Katab, and also uh, Representative Ebel, and a uh, person... Uh, who actually testified, um, B.B. Casey. And Car uh, Karen and B.B. were both instrumental in getting the first dyslexic bill through. So we've been, we've been kind of uh, back and forth and, and discussing this and trying to get something that we thought uh, would be palatable to everybody and yet uh, achieve the two purposes that we have. And the two purposes are more testing for dyslexia and also immediate intervention or, or soon intervention. So basically this, this um, amendment takes out uh, the Dibel's um, uh, reference that, that we've had before and just use evidence-based screener for identification. And um, the rest of it, I think you've seen before in the other, the other ones, we changed some of the um, dates uh, we took out uh, January 1st and, and did the initial screening shall be completed no later than 60 d school days of a student entering public school. And that was uh, to cover students who come in uh, not right at in September. Um, and the um, intervention uh, was the next part of it. Um, the, that uh, secondary assessment within 30 days was the second testing and then there would be um, intervention initiated within 21 days of the initial screening if they tested positive. As well, we've you, you can see charter schools have, have been mentioned in this where um, before they weren't, uh, they, were, they were mentioned in the first part, but um, we've also continued that down into section two. And then the big difference between this and the last two amendments were that it taken out the financial uh, note where we tried to get the amount of money that was given to a school after third grade if someone hadn't reached proficiency. Uh, we were trying to incorporate that as a incentive for uh, or to give money to schools for the um, intervention, but we took that out because we feel that um, schools now have the ability to do interventions. A lot of them are trained um, and schools once they're aware of the dyslexia issue, um, have been able to meet it. So it no longer probably should have a financial note because it doesn't. 
So that's basically the changes. Re Representative Tanner, I see on line 30, or excuse me, 29, uh, you did make the change, and I think it's a positive change. During this time, general education accommodations, uh, and it once read, during this time, general education intervention. Right. So sorry, intervention yeah. really is the wrong word there. Right. Accommodation would be a, a better terminology. Yes, and it, it makes it, that's another reason for removing the financial note. The accommodations, again, are something that's ongoing in, yeah. in public schools and charter schools. Further discussion? Representative. Cascadden. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just want to add um, to keep in mind the scores that were published recently that showed the decrease in kids' performance in reading really can be related back to the times that schools were closed for COVID. So if you have a kindergartner that got done kindergarten in March and then had remote the whole following year and then come to school on in grade two, the scores are going to be substantially low. Uh, because of that that gap. So I think this bill is very needed because it is very targeted and more directed. I'm a little disheartened that RSA 259 did not work for that purpose, but I think this bill would. So I would support it. Further discussion? So at this point in time, we have the amendment on the floor, and it's Amendment 05- one six H. Is there any further discussion on this amendment? Yes, Representative Luno. Mr. Chair, just to be clear, um, this bill has not been amended by any of the preceding amendments either. Is that correct? That that is correct. correct. Okay, thank you. So, she needs to move. so I would like to move that as an ought to pass on my amendment. Okay. Um, is there a second to the amendment, Representative Luckus? So we have a motion on the table for the amendment that's just been spoken to, 0516H, made by Representative Tanner and second by Representative Luckis. Further discussion? Not seeing any. Uh, Madam Clerk? Vice Chairman Cordelli? Yes. Representative Luckis? Yes. Representative Ford? Yes. Representative Belcher? No. Representative Nodder? Yes. Representative McDonald. Yes. Representative Noble. Yes. Okay. Representative Petternell. Yes. Representative Cortiello. Yes. Representative Myler. Yes. Representative Cornell. Yes. Representative Tanner. Yes. Representative Luno. Yes. Representative Ellison. Yes. Representative Woodcock. Yes. Representative Morton. Yes. Representative Balboni. Yes. Representative Cascadden. Representative Gaiman. Yes. yes. Chairman Ladd. Yes. 19 yeas, one nay. Representative Cordelli, recognized for a motion. Uh, yes, I'd like to move out to pass as amended with Amendment 0516H. I'd like to second Tanner. Yes. Thank you. Cordelli. Cordelli. Tanner. Tanner. And then that. Further discussion from Representative Cordelli? Nothing further. Representative Tanner? Yes, I'd just like to say thank you for the support on the amendment and hopefully the support for the, the bill. Um, this is a life-changing bill. Uh, students who cannot read because they have dyslexia um, or another impediment, um, once they get to you know school and they're in second and third grade and fourth grade, they're still struggling to learn to read while their classmates are reading to learn. And that's how they fall behind and they may never catch up and it's life altering. So thank you. And just a comment, I'm, I'm sure that Honorable Jack Balcom is looking up atop at us, down on us and saying thank you. Further discussion? Madam Clerk? Vice Chairman Cordelli? Yes. Representative Leckes? Yes. Representative Ford? Yes. Representative Belcher? No. Representative Nodder? Yes. Representative McDonald? Yes. Representative Noble? Yes. Representative Petternell? Yes. Representative Cortiello? Yes. Representative Myler? Yes. Representative Cornell? Yes. Representative Tanner? Yes. Representative Luno? Yes. Representative Ellison? 
Yes. Representative Woodcock. Yes. Representative Morton. Yes. Representative Balboni. Yes. Representative Cascadden. Yes. Representative Damon. Yes. Chairman Ladd. Yes. 19 yeas, one nay. Any objections to consent? Will there be a minority report? I'm not in consent. Thank you very much. The next bill, we're Who's going to write the report? Representative Cordelli will. Uh, Representative Tanner, if you, yeah, uh, Representative Tanner and Representative Cordelli will get together and write that report. Okay, we're jumping over 382 as that has been done and completed earlier. Uh, so now we're down on three. Oh, see, no, we're, oh, see, we have 382, 399. Allowing for a testing ex exception for graduation from high school. Representative Belcher. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would note that we just received um, an amendment that went around to this. I've reviewed it. Um, I believe it fixes some of the problems, but I believe some language still needs to be cleaned up uh, as so, such. So, okay, wait a minute. They don't have the amendment yet. It's going this way. Did you, Representative Cascadden, did you pass the round tall that way? As your name, no, wait a minute, this representative, yeah, that's not you. I was looking at the, oh. I need that dyslexia training. Do you, <laughs> I just looked too quickly at it. We don't have enough. Uh, I, w I would further note that this amendment was provided by the uh, representative originating the bill. Um, as such, it's not a committee. Um, Amendment, so it can't be adopted by us at this time unless one of us were to go do this. I believe. We only brought twelve. That's why it's. Uh, oh, okay. In, in any case, um, unless somebody else objects, I would say this still needs a little bit of cleanup. So I would move to retain. Is there a second? The motion that's been put on the table to retain. First, second by Representative Cordelli, Representative Belcher. Do you want to speak to your motion? Yes. Um, referencing the original bill, there was. A very good concept, I believe, in this, but there was a number of items that uh, needed to be cleaned up. The amendment here, um, I'd like to look very closely at and make a few minor changes at um, to possibly try to get this passed next year. I don't think there's a need for high achieving students, the, the next Elon Musk of the world, to be sitting unnecessarily, um, <laughs> probably developing behavioral problems. Um, instead of moving on and, and building the future for us. So I'd like to retain this and work on this so we can get this through next year. Further discussion? Representative Cordelli, you made the second. Do you have any? Nothing further. Representative Ellison? Uh, just not starting the discussion about the amendment, but when I was at the Department of Ed, I was in charge of administering the high school equivalency test. Uh, the current status of that is that it's fairly easy for any 16 or 17 year old to take the high school equivalency test at this point with the approval of the parents and the approval of the school. So I, that'll just be part of the discussion, I guess, is when we get to it. Indeed. Thank you. Further discussion? I had one concern in receiving <clears throat> the sheet that we all received from the New Hampshire School Boards Association from Rebecca Wilson. I don't know if we re you've received that, uh, and I'll read it. Generally, you must be at least 18 years old to take the high set, but most states have provisions that allow 17-year-olds to take the test if they obtain a waiver. Certain states even allow students as young as 16 to take the test if several additional criteria are met. The exact requirements for each state are are in the uh, connection or the uh, link here. The high set consists of five different subtests covering the core subjects of the typical high school curriculum. The questions are all multiple choice except for one essay question. Students normally take the exam on a computer, but a paper version is available as well. The test is available in either English or Spanish. So that was a communication there. Um, my concerns are that um, if, in fact, the state gets into the business of having to develop a test like this or an assessment, 
we're talking about a huge amount of work in terms of a lot of finances associated with to identify and to ensure that the test is ma matching all the standards associated with academic performance uh, in the state and also matching up to those required courses for graduation. So there's a trend, and you'd have to have different forms of the test too, so that you can't give the same version of the test right after. You all, you have to have various different versions of that to uh, and, uh, ensure it's um, um, uh, a test which has uh, got backup so that you don't, or you're not repetitive, and so it's valid. So I do have some concerns about this whole process. I think we're we're getting down into the age bracket where. It's very difficult to uh, ascertain that this would have to be, and I would assume, an extremely gifted individual to be able to test out of high school at age 13. Further discussion, Representative Belcher. Yes, and, and just to speak to your point, I agree with a lot of what you just said, and I think part of the change that is going to need to be made would be to, instead of, instead of mandating a design test, to be able to designate um, a test, and I think we can look and examine what tests may be out there that might be appropriate. I recall, and I don't know how they are these days, but I recall taking the SAT twos they offer for various subjects, and they uh, they grade them according to different percentiles. So that may be something we can look at, and other things as well. Further discussion, Representative Woodcock. Just a question for Representative Belko, if I may. So, Mike, is the intent the intent um, primarily the age change? Or is the intent the DOE taking it over? Uh, I, I think we can put everything up for discussion to where we want to kind of fine tune this thing. If 13 is objectionable, I, I don't really have a problem with 13, but if we want to look at 14 or 15 or something like that, if that if that's what it takes to get it passed, I would be fine looking at that. Um, but I think there was a number of tweaks that needed to be made, and I think we should put everything on the table. Thank you. Further discussion? The motion on the table uh, up front of us right now is to retain <clears throat> this bill. No, not seeing any further discussion. Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Vice Chairman. Vice Chairman. 399, uh, allowing for testing exception for graduation from high school. Vice Chairman Cordelli. Yes. Representative Lekas. Yes. Representative Ford. Yes. Representative Belcher. Yes. Representative Nodder. Yes. Representative McDonald. Yes. Representative Noble. Yes. Representative Petternell. Yes. Representative Cortiello. Yes. Representative Myler. No. Representative Cornell. No. Representative Tanner. No. Representative Luna. No. Representative Ellison. No. Representative Woodcock. No. Representative Morton. No. Representative Alboni. No. Representative Cascada. No. Representative Damon. No. Chairman Ladd. Yes. Ten yeas, ten nays. Further motions? Moved ICL. Is there a second? Second. Motion made by Representative Meyer, second by Representative Damon to ITL 399. Further discussion? Yes, Representative Tanner. I, I also think this is uh, actually trying to be placed under the wrong place in the statute. So this is uh, under a statute that talks about compulsory education. Um, and I'm not sure testing out is, is there. Plus, you know, we spent wonderful time on having PACE, <laughs> um, performance-based assessments. And uh, it's very difficult to do in a test like this. So thanks. Further discussion? I'd like to just discuss it a little bit. Um, if you're looking, we're looking now at the primary bill as it was introduced. And I'm looking at lines 24 through 26. Any child age 13 or older, whether a citizen of New Hampshire or elsewhere, may take the test. Any child who passes the test shall be issued a high school diploma equivalency certificate and be accepted from compulsory school attendance issues. It goes on down further and says that the results of this are going to be what guaranteed by our university system, our post-secondary education system, 
we've had no communication from the post-secondary education system, whether they do that or not. We're having a hard time getting uh, community college courses transferred and accepted at the university system in New Hampshire. Um, now we're talking about something that a 13-year-old does. Um, so I have real misgivings of even going forward with this bill at this time. Further discussion? Representative Cornell. I, as a former middle school guidance counselor, a 13-year-old is a seventh grader. And in my mind, a seventh <coughs> grader testing out of school and not going to a, a secondary school because we have no indication that they're going to be accepted. I don't know what they'll be doing. And I just have visions of them sitting home and babysitting. Or we've, I think everybody's been reading in the paper or seeing on the news the employment of underage kids working midnight shifts places. Um, and if they're out of school, none of that, I guess, applies to them anymore because they can just go to work 40 hours a week someplace. And I, I think 13 is just too young for something like that to be happening with or without parental permission. So I, I, I just find this upsetting. That's all. Representative Belcher. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I actually had a question uh, for you or, or for anybody who could possibly answer this. Given the amendment that was just put before us, if this bill were to be killed today, is this amendment sufficiently different from the original bill that it can be reintroduced by the original uh, representative next year? Yeah. No, I, 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 it will not be able to be uh, put forth in the second year of the biennium. Okay. It's too, too close to what we have right here. Thank you. Representative Luckus and then Representative Cascadden. The idea behind being able to test out of compulsory high school attendance at the age of 13 is not for the kid to be on their own or anything else. It's for them to be able to follow whatever interests or passions they have. If you have a gifted musician, and I know of some, um, who are already at that age symphonic capable, right? Um, why should it, if they if they have shown that they understand all of the high school stuff by taking the test, why should they have to be spending their time doing that instead of working on whatever the instrument is and working with an orchestra? That's still supervised. It's still education. It's still, but it's no longer sitting, learning the things, or sitting through the presentation of the things they already know and so the idea is yes it's probably going to be as somebody said they'd have to be gifted to pass this that's the point and the point is if they have an area of particular gifting why if they already know all this information why should they be sitting through school instead of pursuing whatever area that is whether it's engineering or music or Whatever area that is, why should they not be able to use those years pursuing that and getting better at that and contributing sooner as an, as once they are adults? So that's the idea. It's not sitting at home on their own working whatever. It's the ability to pursue whatever their gifted area is. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to follow up a little bit here. I think there's a lot of information in here, and concept-wise, it has some good points. However, when you read the last sentence on page one and continue on to page two, I have real problems with it. And it says, any nonprofit institution of higher uh, learning in New Hampshire that offers an associate's or bachelor's degree that does not accept a passing score in this test as sufficient for matriculation or which impose burdensome regulations for graduation that subvert the intent of this law shall be subject to having its state funding reduced or removed by the general court. That's one heck of a threat. And I don't think that is going to really carry over that well with the university system, the Hampshire UNH, Keene, Plymouth, et cetera. Representative Cascadden. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just want to add that we put so much focus on a test, it's only one moment in time. And if the student does really well, so be it. But for a high school diploma, you're dummying down 
the value of that diploma. And, and really, it doesn't determine the mastery of the competencies because I have to demonstrate them oftentimes in some, some form. Um, there's also no assurance of work-study practices that are required or proficiency in any of the content areas. So it's a lot more than being a heavy knowledge base on one particular day at one time. However, I understand the scenario of someone who may track in a professional world, whether it's music or dance or sports, or even someone who's on the Olympic team, uh, they have private tutors or there are arrangements made for them. So if you have a student who's exceptional in music and going down that path, you still want them to have some sort of a well-rounded education so they can function in life outside of that world of music, but not to deter it. So uh, again, one moment in time is a test. That's it. Further, Rec Representative Luckis. The point of retaining is because, yes, there are things like that paragraph that should not be in there. Um, but if we ITL it, we can't fix it. And if we, if we don't pass the ITL, then we still have the ability to fix it and take out those objectional parts and figure out how to make it better. So I would seriously recommend not ITLing it so we can keep working on it. Otherwise, it's dead. We can't do anything next year either. Thank you. Representative Cordelli. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, I have uh, problems with Roman 3. Um, A, even in the amendment, um, a citizen of New Hampshire or elsewhere is uh, accepted from uh, compulsory, I assume, New Hampshire attendance laws. I don't know why someone from another state would be exempt from uh, New Hampshire school attendance laws. Um, and um, as has already been discussed, B and C, I think, are very problematic. Um, uh, I, I like the concept. Um, you know, we've seen um, stories uh, recently even of um, uh, very intelligent children, um, 14, 15 years old, um, graduating with uh, high school and uh, associate's degrees. Um, so I, I, I think this is in line with uh, maybe my view of what was the original intent of uh, uh, our um, competency program, mastery program, if you will. Um, I, I think it does need work. Um, I'm not sure and ought to pass um, what work could be done where and when on it um, to correct the problems. Um, you know, a floor amendment in the House, I think, um, would not be uh, workable on this, this bill. And I'm not sure how the Senate would um, uh, react to this and trying to work on it in the Senate. So uh, um, I'm disappointed that uh, the retain motion um, did not pass. And um, I'm not sure of my vote on the ITL. Representative Tanner? Just as a word from a practitioner, for been in public school for a long time, um, and to follow up on uh, Representative Cascadden, we had numerous students who were really good at skiing who went to a ski academy for several months during the wintertime, and they still got their high school work done because we would the high school itself would, would provide the, the uh, work and they had tutors at the at the school, and when they came back, they were uh, able to uh, certify that they had actually taken that. We had a young lady that just graduated from Kearsarge that actually swam the English Channel, swam the Catalina, uh, did uh, tremendous uh, swimming uh, performance, was able to do that well within the high school. Um, situation and the high school and teachers made accommodations when she needed to leave for different training purposes um, and as you said the even the olympic program has tutors and works with the local schools so um, also if a student is very gifted uh, my experience at a high school is that they can fast track them through high school uh, by taking the core credits and um, be off to college you know and they're junior year or whatever. So um, I think that public schools make accommodations for this. 
Representative Woodcock. Thank you, Chairman Lloyd. And, and I would I would follow up with Representative Cascadens and and Tanner's uh, comments uh, in that when I was the last time I was at uh, working in high school in New Hampshire, I was responsible for part of that programming. How uh, they do that? I would say that uh, the intent uh, of Representative Belcher's uh, piece, that's what I was trying to get to when I asked him specifically, if the concern is really age and all else fails, the parents, still, if, if they have the student that is so exceptional and there's nothing in their RSAs and they don't prefer to go to the high school, they always still have the right to withdraw the student as a homeschooler and put them in a private program anywhere they want to do it. So it's, it's, it's not like we're saying, geez, I, I, and I understand where they are coming from. If you have this, if you have this one student out of 160,000 that's ready to roll, um, they, the parents have the right to do that. And, and, and then probably their parents, I would guess, on the aside would have tutors with them and, and if want this. So I, I think there is an option for parents out here as well as uh, the rest of the school system. I, I don't think there's any need to go back to this at this point in time. And I do have a concern, as uh, Representative uh, from Manchester said, uh, the youngsters who are 13 years old uh, being mature enough to handle this. But I do think parents, when you have the one exceptional kid, do have an option if all else fails, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Further discussion, Representative McDonald. Thank you. I just wanted to add into the conversation another option that we haven't mentioned is the availability of dual and concurrent enrollment. So options do exist for these students that are high achieving. And with that, you can come out with uh, an associate's degree from high school or two years as freshman, sophomore in the U.S. University of New Hampshire. Further discussion? So, Representative Belcher. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just very briefly, I, I think the real intent behind this bill is to look at the, the history of high, very high achieving people. And so often what you find is that they, they couldn't tolerate just sitting around and they dropped out of high school. And they, a lot of them were very successful nonetheless, but what has changed today is that we now live, unfortunately, I think, in a society where credentials mean a lot more than what you're capable of in a lot of instances. And somebody who's dropping out of high school, who now doesn't have a high school diploma, despite the fact that they're gifted, they're going to be severely handicapped when it comes to moving on with their life and doing good things, unfortunately, just because of that credential. And I think that's what this is meant to address. Further discussion from the committee? Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Vice Chairman Cordelli? Yes. Representative Leckis? No. Representative Ford? No. This is on ITL, yes. Well, to ITL? ITL is the motion on the floor. Okay. No. Representative Belcher? No. Representative Notter? Yes. Representative McDonald? Yes. Representative Noble? No. Representative Petternell? No. Representative Corotiello? No. Representative Myler? Representative Cornell? Yes. Representative Tanner? Yes. Representative Luno? Yes. Representative Ellison? Yes. Representative Woodcock? Yes. Representative Morton? Yes. Representative Balboni? Yes. Representative Cascadden? Yes. Representative Damon? Yes. Chairman Ladd? Yes. 14 yeas, 6 nays. Will there be a minority report? Who's writing it? Belcher. Okay. Completed by the time you leave tonight. <laughs> That's why I didn't volunteer. <laughs> okay. Next bill on the docket here. Does anybody have to take a five minute break here? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I sense that. So let's. <laughs> I'm sensing it too. <laughs> Okay, we'll take a 10 minute break.
Okay, we're going to pick up the uh, exact sessions right now. And we're going to go back to HB 168 relative to surety and indemnification for career schools. And for discussion purposes, uh, I'm going to have Representative Cordelli just finished talking with Director Appleby regarding Primex and uh, getting in that insurance stuff. Um, so, Representative Cordelli. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes, I talked with uh, Director Appleby just now and um, explained where we were with the bill. And uh, he did not think that he was going to be able to um, explain everything to Primex or other insurance carrier um, in a short time frame. Um, and we discussed the fact that um, we have HB 155 already retained, um, which uh, does um, uh, something similar with the surety bond. Um, so uh, I think the recommendation is that we um, ITL 168 and work on 155 as our vehicle for moving forward with the surety bond issue. So, Madam Clerk, where are we where were we as far as the last motion we made on on one sixty eight? The motion ITL. Yeah, I think we would. Um. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, I just was looking at it, the last one because I crossed it out. It, okay. ITL withdrawn. So, but I crossed it all so, out. So I was looking at above that where we it was okay. Retained. So, Representative Cordell, I'm going to recognize you for a motion. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move ITL on House Bill 168. Is there a second? second. Representative Myler seconds the motion to ITL 168. Further discussion? Not seeing any. Madam Clerk, just when you're ready. Vice Chairman Cordelli. Yes. Representative Bleckes. Yes. Representative Ford. Yes. Representative Belcher. Yes. Representative Nodder. Yes. Representative McDonald. Yes. Representative Noble. Yes. Representative Petternell. Yes. Representative Quartiello. Yes. Representative Myler. Yes. Representative Cornell. Yes. Representative Tanner. Yes. Representative Luno. Yes. Representative Ellison. Yes. Representative Wilcox. Yes. Representative Morton. Yes. Representative Almoni. Yes. Representative Cascadden. Yes. Representative Damon. Yes. Chairman Ladd. Yes. 20 yeas, zero nays. Very good. Good with consent. Thank you. Okay, uh, going down below where we dropped off on that 399s, the last bill we did, uh, 517, as you recall at the beginning here, that's when we already have done, went out, ought to pass, 19 to 0. Representative Myler had made that motion. Um, so jumping over 517 down to 528, relative to school lunches and establishing the meals for students fund. Representative Belcher, you're recognized for a motion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would move ITL. Is there a second? Second. There was a second made by Representative Woodcock and motion made by Representative Belcher. Right. Uh, Representative Belcher, you, you can speak to your motion on 528. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this bill would um, establish requirements on schools for serving breakfast and lunch as parts of the school lunch program. We've seen other bills this session um, that would do the same requirement, and we have ideal those bills as well because this is an unnecessary requirement to be placing on schools. Uh, it comes with a lot of cost, um, and it's just it's it's not a good bill at this time. Representative Woodcock. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I uh, appreciate the comments from Representative Belcher, although I, I don't agree with them primarily. Um, I would say I do agree with the idea a little bit. <laughs> That's not the rationale for it. Um, I think school meals are a significant issue right now. I think food insecurity for youngsters in school is a significant issue right now. Uh, I do agree that this bill is very confusing. It has multiple parts that don't really fly right now. And that there still remains, as Representative Likas and, and Ford and I and uh, Ms. Hall and Ellison from the summer, worked uh, exorbitantly and, and uh, consistently on providing, uh, getting information, studying this, and there is yet another bill to come that is uh, significantly more meaningful uh, and, and uh, able to be uh, hopefully uh, uh, passed uh, by this committee and, and then the House to help students in schools and school meals. So I would agree with my associate from Carroll County 
that this bill should be IPL, but for a different rationale. Further discussion? Rep. San Luno. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, just a question to the chair, if, um, if both those rationales could be included in the, um, in the committee report with some collaboration. Well, the maker in the motion, Rep. San Belcher, would you be willing to put both rationales into your report? Absolutely. Great. Thank you. I'd be happy to have him do it for me. Thank you. <laughs> well, okay. uh, please be collaborative on that. So. And remember, there was also a fiscal note, which they could not determine what the cost of the program would be. That might be noted as well. Further discussion on the bill? Madam Clerk, we're on... Uh, HB 528, relative school lunches and establishing the meals for students fund. Vice Chairman Cordelli. Yes. Representative Luckus. Yes. Representative Ford. Yes. Representative Belcher. Yes. Representative Notter. Yes. Representative McDonald. Yes. Representative Noble. Yes. Representative Pedrano. Yes. Representative Cortiello. Yes. Representative Myler. Yes. Representative Cornell. Yes. Representative Tanner. Yes. Representative Luna. Yes. Representative Ellison. Yes. Representative Woodcock. Yes. Representative Morton. Yes. Representative Balboni. Yes. Representative Cascadin. Yes. Representative Damon. Yes. Chairman Ladd. Yes. 20 yeas, zero nays. Any objections to consent? No. Thank you. The next bill which we have is 536 relative to the Charter Public School Joint Legislative Oversight Committee. I'm going to hand the gavel over to um, Representative Cordelli. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I call on uh, Chairman Ladd for a motion. Yes, I'd recommend OTP on 536. Uh, is there a second? Representative Tanner seconds. Uh, discussion from the maker? Yes. Um, although there are some changes, I think the most significant need for this bill is that the committee meet. Um, the uh, committee uh, was started, I, I, my, my recollection here is that the, back in 1995 and going forward through all those years, there's a page and a half right there of meetings, but then all of a sudden in 2015, they stopped. And we've had, I, it's obvious they had these meetings when charter schools were, were being started in the state and the funding source was being arrived at. Now we have uh, issues which, with all our areas of education, we need some oversight as a legislative body. And at this point in time, yes, the State Board of Education addresses the issue of charter schools, and they have even rejected some of the proposals that have come before them. Um, However, I feel at this time that it's time to get this committee active again. In fact, one of the persons that's noted on the log here as representing education is John Rist, R-I-S-T. In my 15 years being on this committee, I've never recalled that name being on this committee. Um, but Ruth Ward's name is there. Ken Weiler's name is uh, Denise Riccardi's there. And John Hunt who is not on education, is on that. So we need to really revamp this, get it working, so we can get some reports in to us on the July 1 date that's uh, indicated in this bill. Uh, yes, Representative Myler. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Representative Ladd, for moving this. This is an important bill. I mean, we have... In my tenure uh, on this committee, we have moved from uh, 18 uh, charter schools to 30 charter schools. Uh, and in that period of time, we've had three that have failed, uh, primarily for, uh, for lack of interest in the content and also from a, from a fiscal standpoint. Uh, as we expand these charter schools, uh, we need to make sure that there is some oversight. Uh, it is a commonplace uh, before the uh, State Board of Education to have concerns about governance of these schools that come before complaints about governance. Um, 
we uh, were successful uh, several years ago in getting a designated staff member. I was, I was one of the ones who worked with Senator Feltus and getting that through. Again, another example of providing uh, those who want to have charter schools, uh, develop their proposal, et cetera, as well as dealing with the governance questions around those schools. And what I mean about governance is that one of the problems you have in charter schools, you have a dedicated group of people who create the charter school and then as new parents come into that charter school, they want to be involved in the governance, but those who created it don't want to give up their sense of ownership to it. And then that can be a problem, and it has been a problem. So I think this uh, oversight committee uh, will help, as uh, Representative Ladd said, meet on a regular basis. This is not a gotcha bill. This is a bill that to provide some sense of oversight and guidance for charter schools that we just have not had since the initial inception of these things in, in, uh, in the mid 90s. So I would encourage people to vote for this because I think it will help um, charter schools be more effective uh, in their uh, mission as they work with their students. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank, Thank you. Did, yes. you, no. you, you didn't I'll, have I'll hand it back over to you. Oh, okay. So, so uh, I'd like to add on to that, that initially when charter schools, they're public schools, and they were developed uh, on the federal level for the purpose of innovation and, and taking uh, ideas and ways of operating and sharing it with all public schools. And with that, I think this uh, particular committee right here, Oversight, would have the responsibility to communicate some of those areas, which are the strengths and to share those strengths of instruction and curriculum with, uh, uh, like we do with the oversight we have of improvement and assessment for all public education. So I think it's a, a need to get this committee working and so we can share in our responsibility for trying to improve legislation, our legislation, <laughs> education throughout the state. Any Yes, Representative Ellison. Uh, just, just a point to, to clarify the membership of prior committees. There is a John Rist. He's former principal of Central High School. <laughs> Thank you very much, Representative Ellison. Further comments from the committee? Seeing none. Um, Madam Clerk. Vice Chairman Cordelli. Mm -hmm. Yes. Representative Leckes. Yes. Representative Ford. Yes. Representative Belcher. Yes. Representative Nutter. Yes. Representative McDonald. Yes. Representative Noble. Yes. Representative Petternell. Yes. Representative Corotiello. Yes. Representative Myler. Yes. Representative Cornell. Yes. Representative Tanner. Yes. Representative Luna. Yes. Representative Ellison. Yes. Representative Woodcock. Yes. Representative Morton. Yes. Representative Balboni. Yes. Representative Cascaden. Yes. Representative Damon. Yes. Chairman Ladd. Yes. 20 A's, 0 nays. Any concerns with consent? Yeah. Thank you. What we're going to do right now, we're going to take a short caucus. We never got to the last three bills uh, in the caucus we had. We'd like to take about 15 minutes here, go through that, and then come through back and finish up our exec session for the day. If we could get out by noontime, it'd be great. I guess it'd depend how long your caucus goes, wouldn't it? <laughs> well, we can go longer if you want, Arlene. Um, <laughs> it's going to be a shot place off the board. Oh, yeah, we'll do two, two hours over there. We'll have to finish up this, because we talked about it. We'll be across the great. Great. Yeah, 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 let's just get this done. Yeah. I'm you have as much fun oh, I'm going to give you never meet. It's always thrilling. Oh, I need to go back to this one. It's a little confusing. Which one? No, I just got to make sure all my my eyes are dotted. And so, so. okay.
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to move on to pass. I'll second. Uh, Petternell. Okay. okay. Uh, Representative Petternell makes the second to the motion made by Representative Cordelli on 553 relative to school district information on personnel salaries. Representative Cordelli. Uh, thank you. Um, the in intent with this um, bill is basically uh, transparency um, for um, many people, um, the public um, and school personnel uh, as well. Um, it's my understanding that some uh, districts might publish the information as part of their annual report, um, but I think it, it would be uh, very helpful to have um, the information uh, of the uh, position and salary uh, posted on the district website. It could be a listing. It could be a, um, a PDF document that's posted. Um, I do not think it is burdensome, um, but I think um, even teachers um, would be interested in looking at the uh, district or the school um, uh, salary structure. Um, and you know, we've heard a lot about teacher uh, salaries in the state. There have been op-eds, et, et cetera, recently about teacher salaries. Um, there's a Senate bill related to teacher salaries. Um, and I think this would be um, an easy uh, way to provide information um, about uh, the entire salary um, structure within a school. Further discussion? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I have serious concerns about this bill. Uh, I, the collective bargaining agreements are available publicly. The uh, school accounts are available publicly, um, those pieces. When you start putting people's names and salary, uh, particularly in small towns uh, like teachers, on a website, I, I think this has a real... To me, it's a real negative intent. I don't see it as a positive piece at all. People can access the information. They have it, in, as Glenn mentioned already, in, in some of the annual reports. There are other ways to access it uh, through the CBAs and, and through the warrants when they're voted. I think this puts teachers and supervisors and administrators just a continued negative light in many communities, particularly those that, that are uh, uh, struggling financially. Uh, I, I just, I have a real, I, I think there's, Limited good, if anything, can come from this. Thank you. Thank you. From personal experience, uh, at one point during negotiations a while ago, um, they published all our, our salaries, our names, our, our degrees um, in the paper. And the result of that um, was kind of mixed. A lot of teachers felt embarrassed that people found out how little they made. That was one thing. But it, it really did do exactly what you just said, Representative Woodcock. Um, you know, we had eight towns in Kearsarge, and some of them are pretty small. And uh, it, it was really tough on a lot of people. And, and uh, people were getting accosted in the, in the supermarket and that sort of thing. And I also uh, had a lot of comments from people who work in business who said, I can't believe you're, they're doing this because in a business or anything else, can you imagine, and a lot of you have worked outside of schools, can you imagine having your, your salary published in the paper and what that might mean, so. Representative Cordelli. Uh, thank you. Um, the intent was the position, not the individual's name. So uh, it'd be third grade teacher A, or et cetera, the position um, and the salary. Um, even though I think that uh, teacher names are uh, and their salaries are public information and would be um, available on a 91A request. Uh, well, taxpayers are paying these salaries, so they have every right to know where their money is going. And it is public information. They can access it through annual reports and such. Um, however, this improves the access to information. Some towns don't publish this in their annual reports, um, so it increases transparency. But most of all, it's improving access to information. So I'm obviously for that. Thanks. 
Thank you. Um, you know, I'm checking with New Hampshire Municipal uh, Resources. Um, there already is a, an established mechanism to be able to acquire that knowledge for somebody who wants it. Um, because the law that's followed, again, as somebody already mentioned, is that, yes, um, there has to be transparency of government um, and how the taxpayer's money is spent. And that right is already available under the right to know law. Um, so, no, this, this bill putting, you know, positions of a certain group of people and not everybody who's an employee of the city or the town really is tacky. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So we just voted this morning to repeal, making it easier to see charter school payments. And it feels to me like the same people who thought it was okay to repeal easier access to those payments think we should make it easier to access these salaries. I find a discrepancy in that. No, thank you. Um, information uh, can be available um, uh, via 91A request, but I think it is burden um, burdening. It is a difficult uh, process uh, for many, um, and that uh, uh, it really is not what the uh, intent of this is. The, the intent of this is to make it uh, the information uh, easily accessible uh, to people. Um, as uh, several people have mentioned, some districts might publish it in their uh, annual report, um, which is a step forward. But I, I think um, having it available on the website uh, makes it much more uh, available to people. Um, as staff, you know, might well be interested in seeing what um, administrators are making as opposed to um, the teachers um, in the classroom. Uh, Representative Cascadden. That information is made public when a line by line item budget presentation is provided to the public. So that that is, example is is already there. Um, but this bill is also discriminatory. You're only targeting a certain group just to create negativity and to make the public school look in a negative light again. Representative Cordelli? It is certainly not my intention with this bill to put public schools in any negative light. Um, that's not the intention at all. The intention is to make salary information available. Um, as I said earlier, uh, teacher salaries are an issue. We've seen it over and over again. Um, and uh, I think that this um, would be uh, maybe enlightening information to some teachers working in this school to see how much um, others um, in the school are making. But it's certainly not an intention to put anybody or anything in a negative light. Representative Tanner? Um, just as a response, uh, teachers know what other teachers are making because it is public information and because it is on a line item budget. And, and um, it's also collective bargaining. So teachers are well aware of what other teachers are making. I'd like to take a moment, uh, and then Representative Luno, you can speak. I brought in my town report right here. Everything is in the town report. There's 12 pages of salaries in here. Name of the individual, amount the individual is getting paid, and the position the person is in. Not just for teachers. It even has substitute teachers listed in this. It has any, any dollars which go out for any other reason, be it a stipend, for athletics, or it be it um, a, a bonus, a holiday bonus, which they had. And I found that over the years, and just opened up one thing, this is helpful information in terms of when you're on the advice, budget advisory committee to be looking at this and know where you are. What I learned from this is that my town's not competitive um, with towns south of us, like Lebanon or even with Littleton. 
um, or Hanover. We are for the same teaching job in many, some cases, $20,000 shy. And this is one of the reasons why we have our, have a shortage of teachers in math and science up my neck of the woods. And so this is, in a, in a way, I see it as informative to the public. Yes, you know, we, we have to address this issue. And so it, because it's here on all these 12 pages and goes and goes and goes, um, I don't see any reason why putting it on the web is going to make much difference. Um, I, for one, feel that we're transparent enough with this. This goes out to every person going to the polls to vote. Or you can get a copy at the town office. It's there available. So um, I, I see this as um, a bill that is trying to do what some districts are already doing. I can't say that this is on on by way of a PDF on the a website or not, but I can guarantee you that we put it every year I've lived there right in this book. We used to put in them people are delinquent in their taxes in the thing. And uh, that's now since gone, but this remains. Representative Luno. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and, and, and thanks for um, um, you know, for, sh for showing us that uh, uh, Hopkinton has done that for um, for years as well, and uh, and they don't need a law on the plate in the, on the books yeah, yeah. to um, to do that, uh, but 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 what one of the things you talked about um, on that uh, representative Ladd was uh, was the 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 various um, uh, personnel that are that are that are disclosed in there and that their um, their teachers their support staff their their instructional aides librarians principals uh, 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 I, I don't know how far that goes if it goes to um, to uh, people that may be employed by the district uh, to that provide transportation uh, if it includes if it includes those positions and I'm wondering if it might also include um, a position of let's say somebody that's providing transportation for a, a child with uh, with an IEP being uh, being transported to a, um, uh, a, a you know outside of the district because uh, uh, from time to time I think those positions are are uh, are filled by uh, by members of that student's family and um, and so whether that would be um, whether those positions would have to be disclosed uh, by the the, the um, policy in 553. Well, I can look at one of them right now. I won't say the name. Uh, it says position special needs bus monitor non contract hours insurance stipend employee holiday bonus preschool. Uh, screening and it lists the the money that this individual receives. Right, right, yeah. and 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 you know, so my concern is that by by codifying it, that that we the way it, the way it is here, that that it may compel disclosure of a student's mom or dad who may be driving transporting them to, uh, to an out of district um, um, uh, service provider. Representative Myler, thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't think this is needed. It's already in uh, in law, <clears throat> and it was cited uh, 94C9A, uh, already gives the uh, opportunity for school districts, if they, if they in fact want to do this, to have a warrant article and put it before the, the town. And if they want to do this, they can vote it in for that particular town. So I don't think uh, this uh, universal application for it is uh, necessary, and I'll be voting no on this OTP. Further discussion? Representative Cordiello. Uh, so Representative Ladd um, was showing us the annual report. That's really thick. <laughs> um, not all annual reports uh, provide the information on school salaries. So um, just wanted to speak to, to that. Again, this improves access to the information, but also to um, Representative Damon's pointing out that um, there's a contradiction in voting for House Bill 71 um, and then um, not supporting this. Uh, one of the, I was just looking at my notes for 71 and something that resonated with me was that House Bill 71 was requested by the DOE and that, that along with other things made me 
vote that way. So there was no, you know, I don't think there's any hypocrisy involved in voting one way on 71 and then this way on, on this bill. Representative Myler? Yeah. I've got a question. I'm looking at my notes, and I had on 224 an exec session, and I had an ITO by Paterno and Cordelli. Nine to one. Am I the only one that has that in my notes? That's five six. What bill are you on? That's five. That's five sixty three. Oh, I'm in the wrong yeah. one. Excuse me. <laughs> Thank you very much. I don't, can't remember how many nine to ones. Yeah. Either. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Right. Representative Damon. I see this bill as something that should yeah. be not passed because it should be up to local communities. What? approach to communicating the information works for them. We do, we defer lots of things to local control and I think this belongs there. I in fact think in the nine town district that I represent, there would be different decisions as to how the information would be communicated, partly related to the small population size and invasiveness to professionals that we should respect. Further discussion? Representative Whitcock. Thank you, Carol. I'd, uh, just to follow up on your comments, actually, um, I think the difference between the document you're looking at, Representative Ladd, and this bill is that is uh, non discriminatory, non biased, wide open, every single person. That's the way it is. This bill hones in on one particular group of people, uh, which makes it a bigger concern. Uh, in Conway, we have, similar to yours, Representative Ladd, a very detailed document, but that's but that's not this. This is one group of people isolated out uh, for I think, uh, and and I, I'll take Glenn at his word. It's not a negative intent, but surely it's going to be a negative action. Thank you, Representative Cordelli. Uh, thank you, and uh, thank you for taking me at my word. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, yeah, this is the Education Committee. So I was bringing forward uh, a bill related to uh, school um, uh, salaries. Uh, um, you know, if I if I want next year to bring a, a town salary position, um, you know, I'm sure that will go to municipal and uh, county uh, committee. Further discussion. I'd like to ask, where 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 are we getting the? Uh, the idea that we're only talking teachers here. I wasn't referencing just teachers. I found that where this not only it only deals with school boards, uh, school staff position names. That's what was my point. It's only schools. Yeah. yeah. This book that I have, it even puts down the school board members in there. It's re anybody that receives money is listed. I was just going to say that um, I know that Martown does it as well, um, has the positions and everything, but the PDF is available on the website, so you can access it there. So I'm wondering if other towns also put that book on the, their websites, and that way the information would be accessible. Further discussion? Reps and Lekas? Um, towns who put it up as a PDF or in whatever form electronically are already doing it, that's great. So we pass this and they'll say, check, already done. They don't, we're not asking any more work or anything from them. I think it's the towns that aren't doing it it's for the citizens who want to have that information and don't have it. And so I think that's what this is directed at, not the towns who are doing it. They're already doing it. So great. Is this a local control issue or is this a state issue? How many, how many districts in the state are doing this already? Those are questions which I don't have the answers to. But if, in fact, it's not happening in a school district, why then aren't they doing that? Has somebody requested it to be done or not? Um, I don't have that answer either. So are we making legislation here for what purpose? 
And how do we enforce it? Those are the questions I have. So is there any further discussion? Okay, we have a motion on the floor. Madam Clerk, would you please read the motion? It's OTP. Yes. OTP. It's OTP. Okay. It's OTP uh, relative to school district information on personnel salaries. Sorry, I misplaced the sheet, so I would, that's why I was. Uh, the one that made the motion? Yes, sir. Uh, Representative Cordelli made the motion. And who seconded it? Right. And Representative Patternell. Here, so. Vice Chairman Cordelli? Yes. Representative Lekas? Yes. Or Representative Ford? Yes. Or Representative Belcher? Yes. Or Representative Nodder? Yes. Or Representative McDonald? Yes. Or Representative Noble? Yes. Or Representative Petternell? Yes. Or Representative Cortiello? Yes. Or Representative Myler? No. Or Representative Cornell? No. Representative Tanner? No. Representative Luno? No. Representative Ellison? No. Representative Woodcock? No. Representative Morton? No. Representative Balboni? No. Representative Cascadden? No. Representative Damon? No. Chairman Ladd? Yes. Ten yeas, ten nays. I'll move ITL. Discussion from the maker of the motion, Representative Luno. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, my concern is that the, um, you know, unlike the uh, the voluntary uh, uh, or or local control uh, policy for uh, for publishing positions and uh, and annual or hourly salaries or compensation, um, that uh, that this um, policy in 553 is so rigid. That uh, that it would not give uh, a school district any discretion, but to disclose the names of, um, of of parents or guardians who may be compensated for transporting their their student uh, with an IEP to an out of district placement, and um, and oftentimes these students are are being are receiving specialized services at um, in some cases I know because we've heard this in committee at uh, at six figure costs to the community and um and i know that um when i was on uh, both the school board and the budget committee that uh that we um we would redact information that was shared with the budget committee if a student's identity was going to be uh, be exposed to that and uh, i'm just afraid that 553 would not provide any discretion uh, uh, for a school district to be able to uh, to protect um, uh, you know a vulnerable student's identity, and um, and I just think this is this is a terribly broad policy that uh, deserves to be ITL'd. Representative Cordelli, uh, thank you. Um, there's uh, nothing in here about uh, requiring um, the uh, uh, the purpose. Um, of the uh, payment. Um, I think transportation um, uh, would be uh, simple enough in cases like that. Um, and uh, I think that uh, districts um, would uh, certainly respect uh, confidentiality. Uh, I know of a parent who was um, uh, transporting under contract um, with the district uh, their child for uh, dyslexia um, instruction. Um, and uh, I would think that uh, uh, districts would be wise enough um, not to say that they're transporting, uh, X person is transporting for um, IEP uh, transportation or for um, other uh, types of um, uh, transportation that might uh, reveal confidentiality. Um, so I, I don't see that um, as an issue, really. Further discussion? Representative Luna. Yeah, sure. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and and, and thank you, um, Representative Cordelli, for suggesting that. But I'm just not. Uh, I I don't see it in the in the 
in in the language here in 553 that would give a school district any discretion other than to uh, publish on each school or the district website a complete list of all position names and their annual or hourly salaries and um and i think you know to the extent that um that that the department of education or maybe uh somebody that feels that a school district is not uh, complying with the law, if this were to become law, to the uh, to the the fullest extent, that um, that this discretion that that school boards have right now, when they when they go ahead and, and print lists like the uh, like what is in the Haverhill Town Report, that uh, that they'll have uh, no choice but to uh, disclose the names of parents who are transporting their child um, as a result of an IEP. And in a small town, as Representative Damon was suggesting, people put two and two together and uh, know what's going on. Representative Cordelli. Thank you. There's nothing in here about um, a requirement to post individual names, just positions. Representative Damon. In small towns where you only have one person in a position, you may be listing it only as a position, but it is obviously that person. Representative Lekas. Transportation provider is a position name. It doesn't need any more than that. Further discussion? Representative Tanner. Yes. And in reading the bill, it says position names and their annual or hourly salary. Um, that doesn't mean it's, I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't say positions. It says position names. So it's in. Further discussion. Madam Clerk, we have a motion on the table. The motion is to ITL uh, HB 553, a relative school district information on personnel salaries. Vice Chairman Cordelli. No. Representative Lekas. No. Representative Ford. No. Representative Belcher. No. Representative Notter. No. Representative McDonald. No. Representative Noble? No. Representative Petternell? No. Representative Cortiello? No. Representative Myler? Yes. Representative Cornell? Yes. Representative Tanner? Yes. Representative Luno? Yes. Representative Ellison? Yes. Representative Woodcock? Yes. Representative Morton? Yes. Representative Balboni? Yes. Representative Cascadden? Yes. Representative Damon? Yes. Chairman Ladd? No. Ten yeas, ten nays. For the motions, take it to the no. floor. I'd, I'd like to make a motion to retain. Second. Okay. Um, the reason why I feel that I would like to either see it retained or uh, this is being done, and I believe that. Uh, I don't know if it's being done in all towns but or cities, but they have the capability to do that, and they don't have any anything saying they shouldn't. Um, so I, I believe we're stepping to the turf of local control and of a school board um, or a, a municipal form of government, uh, a select board or a city council. Um, I believe that the, this decision is a local decision. If somebody doesn't like what's going on at the local level, then they have to communicate it there. Uh, I've not seen enough information to convince me that this is a statewide issue. So that's why I present the motion to retain. Who seconded it? Who seconded it? Re Representative Woodcock. Further discussion? Can we uh, do a hand vote? Yeah. Yeah. For retain, you can do that. Yeah, uh, I think we're going to get a. I support. think that you know, I we've done retain by showing of hands before, uh, seeing it it doesn't go anywhere, <clears throat> other than for us. So, 
Any further discussion? Okay, Madam Clerk, would you ask for the hand vote? Okay, how do I do that? Just <laughs> those people. <laughs> Both hands. Those that are in favor of retention. Those who are, who are in favor of retention. Okay. okay, and then I count. One, two, three, four. Did you? No, I didn't. Five. Seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Did I do it? Yeah, I think did I get did. everybody? Yeah. Okay, this is new. Okay. Yeah. So the bill is retained in committee. All right, the next one down is the last one for today, 628, requiring certain non-public schools or education service providers that accept public funds to perform background checks on all employees and volunteers. Representative Lekas, did you have a motion here? Or I, let's see, I, who? I would like to move ITL. Second. Okay, we have a motion made by Representative Lekas, ITL. <clears throat> Who second that on that side, Representative McDonald? Representative Lekas, do you want to speak to your motion? Sure. Okay, I had to find my bill. I was still on the last one. Um, the problem with this, it talks about for one thing, um, volunteers, and what exactly does that entail. But the other thing is, if you read this, what we're going to do, there's two, two big issues to me. We're going to be background checking parents because there are a lot of co-ops where the parents all get together and the kids get together and a parent will teach on something that's their specialty. Perhaps it's something that they do for a living and another parent will teach on their specialty. So now we're going to be background checking parents and I know there is a lot of um, objections amongst the community about background checking parents. But the other part of that is I'm not sure we have yet figured out how we're doing all of these background checks and the people who come in as volunteers to prevent to present a program for one time or two times do we get the background checks and who does the background checks and if it's not an organized actual official school but just a co-op but some of those kids might be receiving money for one thing or another then that counts by this bill but the question is um, who does the background check? Where does it go? Uh, we've heard a lot of issues with the uh, the Department of Safety explaining how they can't just give that information out to anybody. It has to go to an official at a school or school department. We're still working on how to do that. So I don't see how this can even be done. It's got way too many flaws. Thank you. Further discussion? Representative Myler? <clears throat> this is an important bill. Um, as service providers begin to expand, one of the responsibilities this committee has is to ensure the safety of kids. And right now, <clears throat> Perhaps you have it. I haven't seen it in this committee yet. I have no idea what the volume of service providers is. I don't know who they are, where they are, what they do. And it would seem to me that this, this bill provides some sense of uh, safe harbor to look at the issue of where our service providers are and volunteers. So there is a definition of volunteer in, in the law right now. So we're not talking about somebody who comes in from a volunteer standpoint, somebody who comes in and, and is there for a single shot. We used in our caucus, we said, if Yo-Yo Ma comes in and wants to do an instruction uh, for a day, he didn't, he's not going to have to have a, 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 a criminal records check. So the law already defines what a volunteer is. And so it, I, I just think that this bill, as again, going back to some of the other stuff we've had, on the issue of school choice, if we're going to move in this direction, there ought to be some sense 
of understanding from a from a legal standpoint of the making sure our kids are safe. Now I understand the argument. I, I truly understand the argument that well, if you got parents there, they basically monitor themselves. I understand that. But you know, if you're going to have uh, kids go over to the uh, um, the uh, Southeast Soccer Program, for example, and as part of the CFE EFA program, we don't know what's going on there. We don't know who those coaches are. We don't know what their background is. And yet we're going to have our kids go there. It would seem to me that, that it's responsibility of this committee to begin to look at that. And all this bill is trying to do is to provide some sense of, uh, of understanding of what that means. Anybody else that's in school goes through, through a background check at some point in time. And so I would, just, I would just hope people would begin to look at the need for at least to begin to look at this thing as the volume of service providers increased. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Cascadden. Thank you. Just want to uh, reference the 189.13 on um, that's already on the books. There is a section that addresses, um, just take a minute to read a few lines. Uh, a non-public school may elect to require a criminal history records check on selected applicants for employment or selected volunteers. And a non-public school that elects to conduct a criminal history records check shall comply with the procedures and requirements set forth in the sections. So it's selected volunteers and selected applicants. Now, when you look at the EFA, use of EFA funds, there are several driving schools that are on that list that someone could use their EFA funds for driver's ed. So you could potentially have students who are alone with a driver. They should have a criminal background check. Um, arts, music, ballet, um, taekwondo, or, uh, you know, any martial arts. If there's an individual adult and a student or two students, they should have criminal background check. I don't think the intent is that the parent who's homeschooling needs a criminal check. That's, that's not the issue here. It's making sure that it raises the bar on the law that's already on the books that say they may do it instead of now saying we require to do it because we want the safety of the kids. In whatever scenario they are, alone with an adult or with any adult working with kids in some capacity. So it is selected volunteers, selected applicants. I mean, EFA, whoever oversees that, could go through their vendor list and determine how are they providing education to students and determine whether it's feasible for a background check or not. So that's what this law does. Further discussion, Representative Leckes. I'm not sure how they're determining whether it's feasible for a background check, given that this says that they have to have one. Um, I also don't understand how having one background check makes any kid safer, given that, as you said, the public schools have to. And I can tell you that my daughter's best friend was pregnant from uh, one of the teachers in the school. And so I, don't, I think background checks make you feel good. <clears throat> I don't think it actually does anything. And so far, you haven't explained to me however much we want. And I agree. I would like to know whether somebody is an issue or not before I let my kids go there. But I want to know how you're going to, if you're, say, a co-op. Now, a co-op has to provide um, money for a, a space to meet or whatever. And so students get charged for that. Students may use their EFA money to pay for that facility, and it may just be parents teaching other kids, you know, teaching each other's kids, how they are not a school, how are they going to um, get the background checks done? I mean, it's nice to say, oh, you have to do it, but how are you going to do it? That's my question. I, I don't see this as being feasible. Now, eventually, we're talking about the Department of Education being able to, you know, have a depository and any of these people could do a background check one time and it would be on record and then people could check, but we're not there yet. So how can we pass this law when we don't even have a way of implementing it yet? Thank you. 
further discussion, Representative Tanner, then Representative Cascadden. Thank you. I guess uh, just to address a couple of issues, one about the volunteers that um, school districts actually or can make up the what they consider designated volunteers and the vast majority of them that if a volunteer comes in on a one time basis or if a volunteer is in a situation comes into my classroom, I'm in the classroom, it's actually supervised. Uh, what they have volunteers do background checks is when they're one on one or one on two and they come on a regular basis. So there's the designated uh, volunteers, as uh, Representative Cascadden said, in 189.13 has already been talked about. Camps, athletic camps in the summer, any kind of camps, um, have to do these background checks. And we actually had someone come and testify that she worked in a co-op but she also got background checks for Girl Scouts, get background checks when she was with a, a fish and game, a rod and gun club, uh, did work. So there are people doing background checks all over the place. And we have it now for substitutes where a substitute can get background checks that apply in different places. We have it for transportation people. What we're really doing, as Representative Myler said, is trying to make kids safe. Now, there's no 100% guarantee we know what happens in schools. We know what happens in churches. We know what happens in with parents, that there's incest. We know things happen. But what we're trying to do is we're trying to make things as safe as we possibly can. And one of the things that we've, as a society, said that helps us see if somebody is safe is to do a background check. And the background check that schools have or people that work with children is much different than the person that goes in and gets a background check to work at Walmart. They're concerned with robbery or murder or arson. The school checks, the checks with working with children extend further and deal with tra trafficking, child trafficking, child pornography, different issues like that that are specific that would endanger children. So that's what this bill is meant to do. Um, and I really think that um, it's worth consideration and um, it is feasible. We know we can do it. Um, so that's that's my response to some of the questions. Representative Cascadden. Just wanted to add that there is a system from my experience um, with people outside a school district um, who need criminal background check and that's through the state police barracks within your region. So I don't know if that's the case all over the state, but F Troop in Twin Mountain will do background checks for whatever you need it for. So the, the service is there. Representative McDonald. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd just like to remind the committee of the extensive testimony we had in opposition to this bill. Overwhelmingly, the testifiers that took time out of their day to speak to us opposed this bill. I have one quoted as saying that it's a baseless inquisition on homeschool families and knowing that it is almost discriminatory against a certain class of parents that's looking for a problem when a problem may or may not exist. I just don't know why we would support something like that. Further discoveries in Belcher. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I would like to highlight that safety is obviously an important issue. But there is a line that you cross when you go from safety to safetyism, And when you start dictating to parents who needs to get a background check when they're, when they're getting together in their little homeschool pods and this, that, and the other, this, that's nothing but government overreach. Parents have the ability to make these decisions on their own without any sort of interference from us or anyone else. Further question or discussion, Representative Cordelli? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, a number of things. Um, first, um, tax credit scholarships, EFAs, uh, money is going to families, and they are making individual private choices. Um, let me quote former Supreme Court Justice for New Hampshire, Charles Douglas. The court drew consistent distinctions between government programs that provide aid directly to religious schools 
and programs of true private choice in which the government aid reaches religious schools only by the result of genuine and independent choices of private individuals. This is getting into the lives of private individuals. Uh, two, um, this bill references um, continually um, 189, was it 13A, right? That statute references that these background checks are to go to school personnel, SAU school district personnel. So are we saying that background checks of a volunteer or um, a homeschool um, parent support person who comes in to help the homeschool parent, they have to send the background check, they have to get a background check and send a background check to the local school, what are we saying? It's not, it, it, the bill is, is um, a flawed from a whole number of uh, perspectives. Representative Cascadden. Obviously disagree when you look at the service provider list, I'm not talking about um, putting parents through a criminal background check, I'm talking about the providers that are giving some sort of lesson or education to a child, whether they're a homeschool child or not, it's to me is irrelevant. It's the service provider that people are using EFAs for if they are ever in a small group with a kid. So the onus is not on the parent to get the background check, but as a parent, if I'm homeschooling and I want my child to go to McIntyre ski area for a private ski lesson and I pay for it with the EFAs, I'd want that instructor to have a criminal background check because I wouldn't trust anybody to be with my child. So it's more in the service provider. Same when I go back to the driving school. Do you want your teenage daughter to get into a driving school situation not knowing any background on that driver? Absolutely not. Nobody would want that, but that's the intent here for those vendors to have criminal background checks so that they can advertise that they are safe. They're on a service provider list. We don't know if they're ex-felons or not. I mean, what's the vehicle to do that? So that's what this bill would do, in my opinion. Representative Cordelli? Um, thank you. Uh, I agree with one aspect of what you said. Uh, that parent who takes their child to a uh, ski area for ski instruction, it's up to them whether they have this uh, ski instructor get a, pro, uh, get a background check or not. It's not my responsibility as an education committee member to do it mm -hmm. or the state responsibility to do it. It's the parent's responsibility to do it if they want. Um, and let me just quote from the letter that we got from the Catholic Church also. Um, that... That is why the fingerprint-based checks for the dioceses of Manchester schools are carried out by the Division of State Police pursuant to the federal Adam Walsh Act, specifically the School Safe Act 34 U.S.C. 2962. So they're doing checks on their personnel. Further discussion from the committee? So that's good. Representative Lekas. I wonder if all those McIntyre people do have checks because you brought it up, but I realized that our school key, ski club goes, I mean, our school ski club goes to McIntyre. And, and so the question is, are they or are they not? I have no idea, but I don't think I particular, I, I was a chaperone and at any rate. That, For, further discussion? Yes. Yes. So I'm a newbie here. Thank you very much for letting me speak. I just have a question for clarification. Current school personnel are subject to background checks and this would do background checks on anyone related to a school district and that includes people who would be receiving any kind of EFA money, yes? So, the question is, we just voted down or are in debate about whether or not 
to make everybody's salary a transparency issue? Wouldn't this fall under that same kind of thing like transparency issues? If we're doing background checks at the school level, shouldn't anyone who receives EFA funds do background checks as well? Representative Lekas. At the school level, it's done by the school. But if there's not a school, who's going to do the background check? And then we did have the Department of Safety here explaining who, who can do those. And they did not find a way yet for the random parent to do it for other random parents. Who gets the, who, and, and according to this, it would be the school. What school? Which school? If you have uh, parents getting together from five different towns, who's doing the background check? Who's getting the background check? They're not employees of the school. How is the school even going to get it? I mean, that's, it's, it's a nice idea, but we don't have anything in place for those fingerprint checks to actually be done. Yes, you can do a New Hampshire one, but that's not going to be that full level one that they're talking about here. I don't see how you can even pass this when we don't have the mechanism in place to do it yet. Further discussion, Representative Myler. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to inform the committee that should this uh, ITL motion fail, uh, we will be putting forward a retain motion on this for the committee to consider. Further discussion from the committee, just something for clarification purposes. As a superintendent, when you go through and you're doing these checks or your designees doing it, this is not information for the public. This is all kept close to the chest and for a number of reasons. Okay, uh, further discussion? Okay, Madam Clerk. Motion is ITL on 628. Background checks on all employees and volunteers. Vice Chairman Cordelli. Yes. Representative Lekas. Yes. Representative Ford. Yes. Representative Belcher. Yes. Representative... Nodder. I got a new yes. sheet, but sorry. Representative McDonald. Yes. Representative Noble. Yes. Representative Patternell. Yes. Representative Cortiello. Yes. Representative Myler. No. Representative Cornell. No. Representative Tanner. No. Representative Luno. No. Representative Ellison. No. Representative Woodcock. No. Representative Morton. Morton. No. <laughs> Representative Balboni. No. Representative Cascadin. No. Representative Damon. No. Chairman Lett. Yeah. No. No. Yeah. Yes. Sorry. Yes. He just said no to me. I said, wait, the Yes. I'm saying, I'm saying yes for the ITL. Okay. So, Representative, let's go Where back. Representative Damon. Hold it. Where were you? The motion is ITL. The motion is ITL, yes. Representative Damon. No. Which was? ITL. You had already said nay, but you sounded. Yeah, so mine's a yes. Okay. Chairman Ladd. Yes. 10 yeas, 10 nays. Good. Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion to retain. There's a second. second. Okay, we have a motion made by Representative Tanner and second by uh, Representative Myler. Discussion, Representative Tanner. Um, I think this uh, is a safety bill, and I think um, some of the questions can be answered, and, and if amendments need to be made, they could be made to this bill, but I, I really think that student safety is uh, key here. Further discussion? I think we've had enough conversation. I do too. It's lunchtime. Any further discussion? We have a motion to retain on 628. Madam Clerk? Vice Chairman Cordelli? Yes. 
Representative Lekas. No. Representative Ford. No. Representative Belcher. No. Representative Nodder. Yes. Representative McDonald. No. Hold on a second. One, two. Representative Noble. No. Representative Petternell. No. Representative Cortello. No. Representative Myler. Yes. Representative Cornell. Yes. Representative Tanner. Yes. Representative Luno. Yes. Representative Ellison. Yes. Representative Woodcock. Yes. Representative Morton. Yes. Representative Balboni. Representative Cascadden. Yes. Representative Damon. Yes. Chairman Ladd. Yes. 13 yeas, 7 nays. Okay, the bill is retained. With that, we're down at the bottom of the docket for today. I would like to remind people that made these motions that we need to get the committee reports or the minority and majority report completed today, please, so we can get this to our administrative assistant. If you're not sure whether you made a motion or not, check in over here before you head out of the out of the door here. Anything else for the committee at this time? Uh, Not seeing. Thank you very much, and have a good afternoon. Um, okay. We, uh, you have a copy of that list. Uh, I, I will. Uh, I'll get copies made. Um, oh, you got another sheet there too. Yeah, I got it. Uh, yeah. Check on uh, those other two bills. What do you need? We're trying to get them today if we can. I, yeah, tonight's fine too. Yeah, yeah, I know I'll get them then. I want to just check on.